you, you know, small organizations uh, who have very, you know, smaller employee base, they always come and say, hey, we don't have room for failure. Uh, if we fail, we go out of business. Or if we fail, you know, we lose a contract. Yeah, that's crap. Uh, no, I mean, it's really, I mean, it's just kind of like, it's a cop-out. It's it, what the person's telling you is they're not comfortable with the idea that uh, that people could fail or they're afraid to admit that there's failure. Mm. Um, nothing significant happens without it. Mm. And in small businesses, uh, you look at an entrepreneur like myself, yep. I've got uh, f five startups, uh, two successful. You know, it's not bad, two out of five. Uh, a lot of entrepreneurs have uh, have have a longer record of of, yeah, of learning yes, <laughs> before yes. they succeed. But fast. but that's all when you're when you're doing that. That's all a part of the process right. of becoming a successful entrepreneur. Right. Is trying things and you know getting bruised a little bit. So I'm venture capitalists and I and I have had um, um, some friendships with venture capitalists and taught with one. They look for failure on your resume. Mm. They don't want to hire somebody. They don't want to invest in somebody right. that hasn't had some failures that they've had to overcome. Right. Because you're not, you know, you're, you're, not. you're still wet beyond the ears then. Point number nine really relates to the, the fourth challenge, leadership and, and natural energy. And uh, said simply, uh, the kind of leaders that provide the best context for innovation are those that understand how to release the natural energy of their people, how to provide an environment where people feel free mm. to express themselves, to try things. Uh, it's it's hard to do for somebody that's driven by ego. Mm. It's hard to do for somebody that's unwilling to admit that mistakes are part of the process. But there is a kind of leadership which I see frequently, especially in places I call fishy. Yep. In other words, the fish philosophy is alive. In fact, that's, that's yeah. very much related to uh, your yeah. fish. Yeah. Your fish book, right? That kind of leadership that I find in places that are are using the fish philosophy and and making things happen see things kind of things that happen maybe, that they maybe, want maybe to. you can tell us a bit about this fish, fish philosophy for our listeners well they're, they're playful okay first of all the environment yeah the, no, the environments are playful okay. that that, okay. that fishy managers are in okay. i don't think you want to get into a whole discussion of fish uh, you know right now but the, uh, suffice it to say that the leadership i find in in organizations that have implemented the fish philosophy mm -hmm. uh, are the same express the kind of leadership that you need to have for innovation Okay. Is that there's a there's a uh, a willingness to support. There's a willingness of the leader to not have to take credit for everything, but to give credit. There's a there's a willingness of the leader to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. There's a willingness of the leader to to understand that he or she has to model what he wants to see in in people, mm -hmm. and that's the most effective tool that he has. Mm -hmm. Is not telling people what to do, but showing them in his own life. Okay. And those are the kinds of ingredients you find um, in an innovative organization because cat wranglers I mean people cats people who are working on on their innovative capacities uh, re, you know cat wranglers provide the best uh, best environment for those cats to grow and be healthy there really is such a thing as a cat wrangler have you ever seen one no. uh, in the film business a cat wrangler if you're going to use a cat in your film right. and we did in our IDO film okay. uh, a cat wrangler comes with four or five cats in little cages okay. and two little uh, puffy sticks, things sticks with little puffs on the end. Mm -hmm. You pick a cat, they let the cat out, and then okay. try to get it to do what it wants. you want it to do. They use these puffy little things to kind of direct it, guide it, etc. And what do the cats do? Beautiful. Whatever they want to do. Anyway. <laughs> and cat wranglers need to understand that. You have to have free, you have to create a sense of freedom, a right. sense of openness right. in the in the environment that you've got. Yeah. You, you speak a lot about IDO. You know, yes. You, did, did you spend a lot of time studying them? and? Uh, Yes, I did. And what uh, did you learn from them? Well, I went there. I went there just by chance and spent some time with Tom Kelly, the general manager, yep. and then I spent two years uh, convincing them that they ought to let us do a documentary film. And then we went with our cameras and we produced a, a lot of documentary film footage, okay. and the documentary film. Uh, for reasons I'd rather not go into in detail, never hit, never hit the market. Oh, okay. uh, I, th I think they weren't really ready for that level of depth about their intellectual property and the way they do things to, to, to come in front of people. That was part of the reason, I believe. Okay. But in the process, I learned an awful lot. Okay. And it was the last thing, it was really the last thing I needed before I felt like I was ready to write that book. Okay. So what are, what are one or two key insights you learned from IDEO? Well, number, number one is they, under, they understand to a person mm -hmm. that you don't brainstorm you have brainstormers. In other words, brainstorming is something organizations do once in a while. It's kind of contrived. Right. Brainstormers at IDEO are things that happen on the spur of the moment every day in all so. kinds of places. And, they, and the people who rise to the top in terms of the, the, 
the, our most requested are the people who are best in brainstorming sessions. So this has got a kind of a natural hierarchy. It isn't about pay right. or position, but it's about what you can contribute, what you can contribute. Yep. Yep. And so all of that works together to create this environment. They also understand that they don't want their client they don't want to work on a project for a client, deliver it to the client, and have the client say, that's not what I'm looking for. Yep. So I think through their own experience, they've learned that you have, you have little, uh, you, you do some rapid prototyping, you show three or four options, the client responds to them, you go back into the drawing boards, you do it again. All of that was portrayed pretty clearly on a, a film called uh, The Deep Dive, which, which uh, we use sometimes in our training seminars. ABC produced it, okay. not us. Okay. Yeah. Steven, uh, just, just to kind of wrap up this session, yeah. uh, if you could give us, uh, I'm going to give you a couple of categories of people, if you can give them some advice. If I'm a college student, just graduated, came out of the university, uh, and I'm coming to the workplace, what advice would you give me? The, f the first thing is master your subject, and master it in a way where you're, that's thoughtful. Uh, learn the subject matter in such a way that you have access to it on the spur of the moment. We, you know, the, the world of innovation doesn't wait for somebody to Google a subject or to go to Wikipedia or, or do some other kind of search. The sparks happen in the in the in real time, and you've got to be ready for those real time opportunities. Um, the other is make innovation a part of what part of what you study. Um, understand that your contribution to your own life and to the organizations that you work with really is going to max be maximum if you can come into that place knowing how to release the, the, the innovative capacity that you have. Okay. If, if, and if I'm a HR director of an organization, what advice would you give me? Well, <laughs> HR directors uh, always put in a... HR directors are put in such a difficult spot because they're given assignments to do things that they don't have the... The, the power to do in terms of real power, so they have to use influence and, uh, and wiles. And that's where innovation is really important to HR. You're constantly being asked to do things that, you know, uh, you, you want to do with the organization, the, the boss wants you to do it, the CEO wants you to do it, but what, what, what nobody seems to understand is that without a real sustaining sponsor, somebody with legitimate authority, those things are really hard to get accomplished. Yep. And in a, so HR people need to get awfully innovative in terms of different ways to influence, different ways to present material. Uh, I think it's a, a subject that probably has a home there. Final person, if I'm a CEO of an organization, what advice would you give me? Let, leave, let your people free. Let your people free. Let your people free. That's it. If you want a more innovative company, develop more innovative people. Well, Steve, thanks a lot for being on our show. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Um, and have a great trip here in Malaysia. Hi, appreciate it. All right.